Our guest this evening, of course, is the Ambassador of Canada. The title of the address is Canada's Global Foreign Policy Objectives, Regional Stability Issues, and the Canada-U.S. Partnership. The Ambassador uh, did his uni uh, studied at the uh, university at the Seminary of Joliet, receiving his Bachelor of Arts degree, and uh, from Laval University received his law degree. He joined the Foreign Service, or what we would call the Foreign Service, the Department of External Affairs, now the Department of Foreign Affairs and International Trade. He uh, served there in a number of capacities. Initial 12 years, he was in Ottawa with, with, with the Privy Council Office, the Treasury Board, and the Canadian International Development Agency. And overseas, he uh, served as part of Canada's permanent mission at the United Nations and also in the embassies at Beirut and Beirut and Paris. He was named uh, Canada's ambassador to Zaire in 1978, serving there for three years. He returned to Ottawa, where in, again, the uh, Foreign External Affairs Department, he was first policy directory, director for industry, investments, and competition, then assistant undersecretary for manufacturing, technology, and transportation, and then inspector general. In 1985, he was appointed as Canada's ambassador to Mexico, during that time, he received uh, uh, the Order of the Aztec Eagle. The laughter is because we always talk about the Baltimore Oriole, Mr. Ambassador. That's the only <laughs> reason for that. It's the highest uh, award that any Canadian has ever received uh, uh, from the country of Mexico. He served as Canada's ambassador to Belgium and Luxembourg later and, uh, as you know, was recently appointed as ambassador to the United States. Uh, we're absolutely delighted to have uh, uh, him with us this evening. His background to a great extent is in economics. He served as the ambassador to Mexico. He's from Canada. He's now in Washington. And with that, it's my great pleasure to present to you Ambassador Raymond Stratton. Thank you very much, uh, Frank. Thanks for your kind words of uh, introduction, listening to this litany of jobs I've had over the last 30 years. I feel perhaps closer to uh, retirement than I should. <laughs> I'm very uh, pleased and honored to have been uh, asked to speak uh, this evening to the uh, Baltimore World Affairs Council. I come to the beautiful city of Baltimore quite often, normally for a sporting event. In fact, uh, uh, we were quite distressed last uh, fall when the, uh, the, the Colts, the Baltimore Colts, were able to get the uh, Grey Cup away from, uh, from my country and, and, and bring it down here. But the uh, insult was compounded a couple of days ago when the uh, Avalanche, of course, of Colorado, <laughs> were able to get the Stanley Cup, which is uh, probably the most prestigious sporting trophy of Canada, also uh, down to the States. We will, uh, I guess, forgive you for this, just uh, by reminding ourselves that we, after all, won the World Series twice in a row with the Blue Jays. <laughs> and this year, uh, watch for the Expos. They're, they are the sleeper team, and they could very well uh, do it again uh, this year. I would like to, uh, in the next 15 minutes or so, explain to you why and how our two countries, Canada and the U.S., have, have developed what has uh, probably become the most comprehensive relationship of any uh, two countries in the world. There's absolutely nothing like it. And I'd like to, to start my uh, short presentation and then after it uh, answer your, your questions for as long as you, as you will want about any uh, aspect of, of my presentation or, or other issues. I'd like to start by putting our uh, relations into a, a more uh, global perspective. And I'd like to ask you to consider first the dynamics of the 90s. The end of the, uh, of the Cold War, dangerous and, and wasteful rivalry has been certainly our most important, uh, greatest achievement since the end of World War II. But instead of a permanent peace, it has 
reveal both new stresses and old conflicts. Old-fashioned nationalism and the growing influence of regional powers are just but two of the very negative forces that keep the world an unruly place. We have had spectac spectacular successes. We have seen the end of apartheid in South Africa. We have seen the blossoming of the peace process in the Middle, Middle East, and I hope that this process will continue with the uh, recent advent of the uh, Netanyahu government in Israel. And of course, most, re most recently, uh, we have seen the, uh, the Dayton uh, Accords, for which your country has played such a, a significant role. Yet, our world is still not free from the, the threat of aggression, not free from the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, and not free from a great number of unresolved historical tensions. On the economic front, growth and trade has been dramatic. This has translated into the economic recovery of the industrialized world. But it would be, in my view, dangerous to be complacent. We must guard against the proponents of a protectionist agenda who would like us to roll back the clock. It is against this background that we must examine the most important precepts of our relationship, its sheer magnitude and complementarity. I will do so by highlighting the three pillars of that extraordinary relationship. Trade, of course, environment, international political and security cooperation. Let me start with trade. At the core of Canada-US relations lies the fact that our two countries are by far the world's largest trading partners. Many of the more than 230 agreements governing relations between our, our countries involve trade. One of the latest of these, the Open Skies Agreement, has already resulted in a much better air service uh, between our two countries, and also it has made it easier for us to enhance our already impressive trading relationship. Let me give you just a few, a few numbers. In 1995, two-way Canada-US trade totaled more than $334 billion. That's 23% greater than your trade with Japan. That is almost a billion dollars of business each and every day of the year. Canada is also your best export market. In 1995, my country accounted for 22% of U.S. exports worldwide. And now to put those extraordinary numbers into proper perspective, we bought more than twice as much mer merchandise from you in 94 than did Japan, your second largest trading partner. In 1995, we had more trade with you than did the 15 countries of the European Union combined. Inevitably, a commercial relationship of this uh, magnitude creates disagreements, creates irritants. But allow me to share with you something quite remarkable. At present, only one half of 1% of our exports to the US is subject to trade action. And when differences do occur, we now have the means to resolve them. I am very proud of, of this accomplishment. When I arrived in Washington a bit more than two years ago, the irritants represented almost 5% of our trade. Now it's less than one half of 1%. So we're, we're all very proud of this uh, achievement at the embassy. This is due, of course, not only to our good work, <laughs> but perhaps more precisely to the, the more predictable and the more stable commercial environment which NAFTA has been able to create. It is the establishment of more fair and more consistent trading rules under NAFTA and the WTO that is 
in great part responsible for this unprecedented trade and investment expansion between our two countries. In fact, Canada-US trade has boomed under the FTA and NAFTA. We have seen steady increases each year since 1988. Last year alone, trade between our two countries grew by almost 13 percent. And again, just the, the tiny, this, the increase in trade last year between our two countries is more than our total trade with the rest of the world. These numbers would only improve if we were able further to liberalize trading rules. We have to continue our work to minimize the applicability of trade remedies to make ours a truly free trade zone. And I'd like to come back to this later on in the Q&A's uh, period. To be sure, not every sector of our trade is straightforward. We sometimes have differences of policy. One such area at the moment is cultural industries. Please allow me here to go into a little background. Canada is the foremost market for U.S. cultural products. Over 90 percent of films viewed in Canadian, in Canadian theaters by Canadians are foreign, mostly American. Over 80 percent of the contents of records sold in Canada are foreign, mostly American. 60 percent of all TV programming is also American. We Canadians value this unrivaled access to foreign cultural products. But we must also try to safeguard our freedom of choice. We want to ensure that in a tiny fraction of the domestic market remaining to us, we can sustain a viable industry of our own that showcases Canadian artists and portrays the Canadian way of life. The challenge has never been greater than at this time, when technology jumbles the rules and policy often plays catch up. But our government, our public, are committed to safeguarding cultural diversity in our own market. Therefore, we will have to continue managing carefully issues in this delicate uh, area as they, as they arise. But above all, the strength of our economic relationship rests on the health of, of the economies on both sides of the border. On our side, the federal government has brought down its third consecutive budget, which will achieve or better its deficit target of 3% of GDP for fiscal year 96-97. And it will secure its 2% target for the following year. This has been and will continue to be achieved by reducing government expenditure to the tune of $7 of saving to every dollar of new revenue. This year's budget has no new taxes. We have reduced the federal government's financial requirements, what we have to borrow, from 4.2% of GDP in 1995 to 0.7% of GDP this year. This means that Canada will have the lowest projected fiscal shortfall for any G7 central government. We have reduced government spending from 20% to 12% of GDP, where it is at the lowest level in the last, for the last 50 years. And with the help of the provinces and territories, where eight out of 12 are expected to produce a balanced budget or even a surplus, Canada's government sector debt will move from the second highest of the G7 in 92 to the second lowest in 97. 
But the story of our unique relationship goes well beyond trade. We are neighbors, we are friends. Approximately 110 million of our citizens cross the border each year. We share the responsibility of our continental environment. We also share the stewardship of 40% of the world's reserves of fresh water. And to protect this heritage, we have negotiated some of the most demanding and successful environment arrangements in the world. Remember the acid rain problem, but remember also the Clean Air Act that solved a good portion of that problem. We have also the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement that's, that has gone a long way to decontaminate and depollute de the Great Lakes. But there's yet another pillar to our partnership. This relates to foreign policy, defense, and security issues. There, too, we have a relationship that is the envy of the rest of the world. Together, our two countries have helped to found the United Nations. Our partnership in NORAD has ensured the security, the safety of North America for 35 years. Working together in NATO and the OSC, we have helped to, to end the Cold War. And through the Organization of American States in Washington, we're working together now to advance the cause of democracy in our hemisphere. A perfect example is Haiti, where, as we speak, our police officers, about 100 of them, and more than 1,000 peacekeepers, are in the process of consolidating democracy. We're now considering taking over from you the leadership of the military component of the United Nations mission in Haiti. And of course, Canada is part of I-4, where over the last uh, four years we have uh, rotated through more than 10,000 Canadian personnel. I do not mean to imply that we are always in perfect agreement on the foreign, on the foreign policy front. For example, there's one, there's one item on which now we certainly do not see eye to eye. Cuba. Our two countries, when it comes to Cuba, share the same, same goals of a peaceful democratic transition, the return, and the return of a market economy in Cuba. Cuba, that is the last undemocratic bastion in this hemisphere. However, while the United States advocates a policy of isolation, Canada advocates a policy of engagement. While the United States advocates an embargo to pressure the Cuban government to open its society to political change, Canada advocates commercial enga engagement, which we believe will make economic and political change inevitable. Who is right? We think we are. We think we are. Nevertheless, we recognize that it is the United States' sovereign prerogative to conduct its foreign policy as it sees fit. We ask for no less from the United States. While the United States government is entitled to decide whether its citizens will trade and do business in Cuba, it doesn't have the right to decide if Canadian citizens will and also decide to penalize them if they do. The Helms, the Helms Burton legislation seeks to apply US laws outside your borders. This we simply we simply cannot accept. But periodic differences like this aside, our two countries are absolutely uniquely equipped to put our partnership 
at the service of the rest of the world. We Canadians exemplify the flexibility, the tolerance, and the commitment essential to foster political stability in the emerging world of the 21st century. But your country exercises an extraordinary influence in the world, militarily, culturally, economically. It is the only country in the world that can back up its words with effective economic and military power. It is essential that the alliances, that the coalitions, and the new organizations that we have built up together from the G7 to APEC be cultivated and developed. Mesdames et Messieurs, ladies and gentlemen, the trends that have created the successful symbiosis between our two countries are growing stronger as we approach the new millennium. And when I look in, in my crystal ball in Washington, I see even more trade. The FTA and NAFTA have set the tone and are, in my view, irreversible. Our economies are, will continue to be more intricately linked. But my crystal ball also tells me that however you look at possible shifts in political or economic power in the years to come, the United States and Canada will remain each other's most important partners. We will continue to have the largest and the most comprehensive relationship of any two countries in the world. And by focusing on the global horizon, our two countries will bring prosperity to our own citizens while helping the rest of the world to create the kind of future we want our coming generations to inherit. Thank you very much. It will be my pleasure now to answer whatever question you might have. Well, first we thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for a very comprehensive and, and clearly structured presentation. Uh, it's been most informative. And as the Ambassador said, the floor is now open for questions. Yes, sir. The uh, first question is, what will happen in Quebec? I thought it was going to be the second question. Uh, <laughs> I, will, I could go on for, for quite a while on this issue because it is an important one, but I'll try to uh, summarize it uh, along the following lines. First of all, uh, there has been a referendum last October. Uh, Canada has won. It has been a close call. It has been a, a wrenching, wrenching episode for, uh, uh, for us uh, Canadians. And since then, a number of developments have happened. The leader of the uh, opposition, the Mr. Lucien Bouchard, has moved from Ottawa to become the Premier of Quebec. Uh, he has still uh, not called, of course, a general election, and he has indicated in New York last week that he was, his plan was to uh, try to manage Quebec effectively and try to put some order in, in, in Quebec's finances. He has also indicated that he didn't want uh, a new referendum for, uh, for at least three years, maybe more. Uh, so we've got uh, some kind of undeclared uh, moratorium in front of us of, of between three and five years. Uh, in, in that uh, period of time, uh, clearly, uh, as a national government, we have to, uh, to take in, into, ac into account the very strong signals sent to Ottawa by the, uh, by the referendum in October. Uh, the question will be whether uh, our, our government uh, is able to produce uh, in, the, in the years to come uh, some kind of, uh, of uh, plan or, or uh, comprehensive offer, not only for Quebec, but for all provinces, uh, that could uh, result in a greater devolution of, of powers to our provincial governments. Uh, the answer to that question will, in, in a very significant way, uh, determine the, uh, the future of Quebec in our federation. Personally, uh, I'm very confident that we will uh, be able to achieve this goal. But it remains a, a constant issue. As you know, after a hockey, constitutional debate is our second national sport. <laughs> and this debate might go on for a great number of years. But I I'm confident that as a country, uh, we will remain uh, one and united. The question is, would the ambassador please comment on long-distance rail 
travel in Canada, especially between the United States and Canada? Major, major restructuring is, is taking place. Uh, as you know, in, in the last uh, 20 years or so, uh, Canadians have uh, kind of abdic abdicated or stopped using uh, trains uh, to, 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 for the benefit of, the, of their own cars. So a dramatic decline in the domestic use of our, of our uh, railways. Therefore, you have seen both the CPR and the CN uh, laying off thousands of people, uh, thinking and talking about the potential merger, which has not yet happened, but they're still talking. Uh, therefore, uh, and, and VR Rail is also uh, in, involved in, to some extent in, in those discussions. All of that to tell you that this great trip that you could make from the one end of the country to the other is now uh, impossible to, to, to make. You no longer can leave from uh, St. John, Newfoundland to, to go to, to, to Vancouver. Yeah. But it, it remains uh, uh, still uh, an unresolved issue. As we speak, uh, our, the government of Quebec and the government of Ontario and Canada are talking about establishing a, a fast train. A TGV, as we as we call it in French, between Quebec, Montreal, and, and, and Toronto. So all of that to tell you that it's it's somehow in the air. Uh, the American connection, I, I cannot uh, uh, speak with uh, authority on, on on this issue, except that the the CN seems to be coming less and less uh, in, into the U.S. Uh, than, than than it used to come. But that's about it. Um, the question is. Uh why do, does Canada have such high-quality uh, children's television? A number of, uh, of uh, reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, Canada is a, is a huge country with many parts uh, isolated. Uh, all, a premium has always been put on the uh, education uh, of, uh, of our children, especially trying to uh, uh, have, uh, help them to avoid violence uh, and, and therefore that's why our programming is is done uh, with that objective in mind that's why the v chip also uh, is uh, is emerging into canada at a faster rate than it is uh, coming here into the into the us it's to to avoid uh, children to see violent uh, programs on television so now the the greatest uh, initiative that we are taking to to help our children in canada is to have this v chip system installed where parents through just a, a switch can control the the, uh, the access of their children to, to uh, various uh, uh, programming but children's programs have always been uh, uh, probably uh, the uh, I mean uh, the, the top uh, priority of our of our producers in Canada what's your prognosis about a North American Union presumably the United States and Canada I don't see it for the years to come. However, let me uh, flag to you some, uh, some facts that uh, will have to be uh, taken, taken in, into account. With the, uh, the high degree of economic integration that both the FTA and NAFTA have produced, uh, clearly uh, that kind of trade that I was talking about is bound to lead to, to, to something else. Uh, I mean, we, we are now exporting 85% of uh, all, 85% of all our exports are, are coming to, to your market. 25% of all your exports are, are coming to Canada. Technology is, is, uh, is uh, making the, the concept of sovereignty very different than it was 20 years ago. Uh, will there be a next step? Uh, what could that next step be? Uh, these are, are big uh, questions. Uh, uh, it's interesting to see that on a scale of 1 to 10, Economic integration is probably at five or six, but when it comes to political integration, it's zero. Our systems are totally different. You're, I mean, we have a parliamentary system, you have a presidential system, uh, you have all those parliamentary commissions. We have uh, we have a, a different uh, way of uh, of running our, our our two countries. But if you look at the re recent history, especially in Europe, it's difficult to see such a uh, an unmatch, if you if you want. Normally. Uh, such a degree of economic integration uh, get you know or, or should get uh, our two countries uh, closer could it be a custom union would it be a monetary union along the european model i don't uh, first of all our dollar you should know is is quite weaker you would not want to have a monetary union now uh, but i mean 
clearly those issues will be uh, around certainly at the beginning of the uh, of the of the coming um, uh, century but there's a very very strong desire on the part of Canadians to remain Canadians mm -hmm. we admire many facets of American society I mean your great dynamism your, your vitality but we are also very proud of what we have accomplished in Canada we are very proud of just let me mention a couple of examples not only of course of our sporting uh, abilities but think of our health care system we have a, a, a tremendous uh, health care system in, in, in Canada we spend 9.8 percent of our GNP on health care every citizen in Canada is covered here you spend 13.5 percent of your GNP on health care and 40 million of your citizens are are not covered so we're and we, I'm just this is not a criticism just to show you how proud we are of some of our of the programs we uh, we have put in place we have uh, we have an, uh, a different approach to, to to immigration Canada is is a country that needs new citizens we're only 29 million people with the only G7 economy of the world that doesn't have an internal market of at least 50 million people the next ones Britain and Italy have at least 50 million 50 million people so we're very proud of that extraordinary uh, achievement uh, so I mean these are just some of the few reasons why Canadians uh, want to, to to remain Canadian so whatever happens in in, in the years to come uh, this this will will uh, will be taken into account. of course nobody nobody can see if a European model is applicable to, to our two countries and look at what is happening in Europe now there's a, a tremendous slowing down of the unification process in, in Europe and remember Europe geographically is much smaller than the Canada and US combined so these there are tremendous differences that make the comparison perhaps uh, uh, perhaps uh, uh, difficult but uh, we should not be afraid certainly of uh, uh, of remaining uh, close uh, close partners some uh, some commentators around the world have have talked about the demise uh, of the American uh, uh, power of the American empire so many times since I've joined the Foreign Service that I don't believe in it in, 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 any longer the, whatever however you look at the the power structure of the or the political configuration of the world in the years to come it's very likely that the US will 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 keep uh, re will will remain the dominant uh, uh, economic and military power in the world and of course it's very good for us Canadians because it's good it's good business we we don't like perhaps to brag about the uh, about this uh, this tremendous trade but it, it is good for five million citizens on both sides of the border but it, your question is for me in Washington and my colleagues the most important when we're trying to define where will we be 10 years down the road Reverend uh, Kamak uh, commends your your train travel uh, <laughs> secondly as a a, uh, a world federalist he he notes that the uh, Canadian world federalists and the American world federalists uh, appropriately cooperate and uh, that there seems to be a, uh, a especially intense uh, sympathy for globalism among his Canadian counterparts would you care to comment on that yes uh, with uh, with pleasure remember uh, why perhaps you have noticed uh, this uh, this difference uh, we are only 29 million people we have no choice but to be internationalists. we have no choice but to be a trading nation we have no choice but trying to increase our influence throughout the world by belonging to literally every club that exists in the world <laughs> therefore the the dangers the, the the dangerous trend towards unilateralism in, in in your country we do not like and everywhere I go every time I talk to a group of senators or congressmen in Washington I mention this your country cannot afford not to be in a leading role in, in the world but it's a difficult for me it's always a difficult
fight. There's the, there is this, this danger or this tendency to, to, to look inward, to, uh, not to, 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 to be willing to, to participate in the, in the major uh, events uh, unfolding in, in the rest of the world. Uh, so uh, it is uh, interesting to see, and you're right to, to flag it, the different, uh, uh, the different uh, perhaps perspective uh, on the world. If you look at the news in Canada, and if you look at the news in the U.S., you will see that the, the portion of the news dedicated to international affairs is about twice as long in Canada as it is here. There is, this is perhaps due to the fact that you are uh, a great power, uh, and that what takes place here is, of course, perhaps more important than what is happening in, in, in Rwanda and in Burundi, but it, it is, in, it, it is a, a difference. Uh, we uh, also uh, tend to... Uh, rely uh, on the UN uh, far more than the US does. Uh, for us, the UN is, is part of, uh, uh, of our DNA as a country. For you, the UN is, uh, is, is, is negligible and, and quite often criticized. Uh, very few, uh, uh, very few, uh, well, I wouldn't say very few, a great number of, of, of senior people in Congress are reticent about the UN. They, they, they don't uh, necessarily believe in, in what the UN uh, does. They, uh, so our, our, our approach is different. We'd like to work with you to fix the UN, to improve the UN, not to abandon the UN. But it's, uh, th this is, these are some of the, uh, of the, of the reasons why you, your diagnosis is, is, is right. Uh, and and we, will, uh, uh, we will continue to, uh, to, uh, to play our, our role uh, in the world. Uh, uh, don't think that our unity issue has weakened our, our desire to, to participate in the, uh, in the affairs of the world, just, just the opposite. What we're doing in Haiti now is a good example. Uh, you know, we're participating in a, in a peacekeeping operation that is perfectly fitted to what Canada is all about. It is our hemisphere. We've got French-speaking policemen and, and, and peace, peacemakers that we can send down there. There's a huge uh, community from Haiti and Montreal. 60,000 of them, so all kinds of good reasons to, to remain involved. But what we will all have to do, because of the budgetary constraints under which we have to live, is perhaps define better who is going to do what on the international scene. You no longer can afford to be everywhere. You don't want to be the policeman of the world. You might wish to be the sheriff of the world, but not necessarily the policeman of the world. <laughs> you will have to decide where you want to intervene. And maybe the best way to go is for, for our two countries to, to get involved in operations not too far from our base, in our hemisphere, and let Japan and, and, and China deal with problems in Asia. Let, let the European countries deal with small European conflicts in order to, to minimize the cost, but still try to resolve uh, certainly issues uh, that, that produce mass murder or, or uh, unacceptable uh, levels of, of violence. We have a good example now in Africa. A long time ago, I was ambassador to Zaire covering tiny countries of Rwanda and Burundi. It's 1978. And I see now all the signs of again, perhaps a new, tremendously bloody ethnic eruption happening in Burundi. We have to, we have to, to do something. We just cannot let 500,000 people slaughtered. So I'm just mentioning this, this example uh, as uh, uh, one where the international community must, must act. If we lose the will to act in these tragic cases, humanity as a whole will, will have lost a part of, of its all. Would you uh, comment upon that most difficult question, future relations with China, especially the two China question, and uh, how that affects American-Canadian relations? First, at the uh, high policy level, our two countries have the same approach. We have one China policy. You have one China policy. We are facing the same issues when it comes to China. The attractiveness of the Chinese market, a billion and 200 million people, and the difficult issue of human rights. Two years ago, when I arrived in Washington, the administration was struggling with this linkage. Our government decided 
early on, 94, decided to delink human rights with trade. And our prime minister led perhaps the biggest trade mission in the history of the Western world to China. I mean, the 10 premiers, the leaders of the territories were there, and hundreds of businessmen came back, uh, as they like to say, of course, with billions of dollars in contracts. And it was true. But your country moved a little bit more slowly. They watched carefully what would happen, how we did it. A year later, they also delinked. But the issue of China uh, is, 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 uh, uh, is far more uh, complicated than, 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 than just our, our links. Which it's, it's what is happening in China and also the different perspective. You know, when, when it comes to China, you don't deal in months or years. I mean, it, it, it has such a, a long history that, uh, you know, uh, you, you know, if I ask you uh, when was your, your daughter born, you'll tell me uh, in 1975 or 1972. If you ask the same question to a Chinese, he'll tell you, you know, uh, it, this event happened under the Qin Dynasty, and the Qin Dynasty is 500 years long. I mean, their sense of perspective of timing is, is very, very different. So China is, is a world in itself, how, will, how it will evolve. Uh, will it evolve the way Russia has evolved? Uh, they, are doing with, they are doing it just the opposite way. Major economic reforms, political stagnation, human rights problem. Maybe they have been the wiser of the two. Maybe Russia should have done it that way. But I cannot, nobody knows the answer to this, this question. H how will China evolve in the years to come? What will be the relationship with Taiwan? How 97 will happen between Hong Kong and, uh, and, and China? Will it be a smooth transition? Very direct consequences for us Canadians. If it goes smoothly, the pattern of immigration that you have watched between Hong Kong and, and British Columbia, between Hong Kong and, and, and Canada in general, but between Hong Kong and BC will not be seriously affected. But if things were to go wrong, if, thing, if, if, if the transition were to be more difficult, uh, there is this now, this history, of this more than decade-long policy of attracting Chinese from, from Hong Kong into Canada. And I must tell you that it has been very good for us. I mean, this rather important, uh, massive arrival uh, of uh, Hong Kong Chinese in British Columbia has allowed British Columbia to escape the great, depre I mean, the, 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 the latest depression. The economy is booming. Uh, this, the people coming from Hong Kong were highly educated. Many of them brought with them capital uh, that has allowed them to, to create dozens of jobs. Uh, and it has been a success story. I cannot comment on, on, the, uh, on the immigration here in, in the U.S., but we are very pleased of, of what uh, we have accomplished. So stay tuned. I mean, we will have to, we will have to see how 97 will, will evolve. We'll have to watch closely internal developments in China. We'll have to watch closely the debate in your country also about human rights and, and trade. It, it will always be there. Would you uh, describe the trade between the United States and, and Canada in terms of sectors and types yeah. of uh, businesses doing the trading? The answer is very simple. It is literally everything that is being traded between our two countries. Let me mention just a couple of, uh, of sectors and, and their, their significance. Energy gas, oil, $12 billion, huge, huge trade, increasing. We're heating up Chicago and the suburbs in, the, in your cold winters. I was in California last week. We're exporting more and more natural gas to California. Huge agricultural trade. Again, everything, wheat, barley, sugar, name they, they, I mean, dairy, poultry, name it, it's in there. Of course, the Auto Pact. Auto Pact is, has been a great success story. There's absolutely no barrier between Canada and the U.S. when it comes to, to cars. Billions of dollars of trade uh, every year. Communications. Telecommunications is, is an, a new uh, emerging uh, almost a common market. We're trying to harmonize our policies on, on telecommunications. In that huge trade, uh, you've got everything, including, by the way, mil you know, not millions, but 
tens of thousands of, of Canadians, and I'm glad to see that there are a few here in this audience tonight. I mean, as part of our trade, we've got, you should know, a million, a million Canadians in California alone. I was not aware of that until I went there last week. So there, there's, uh, there's literally, li literally everything in, the, in, in this trade. Uh, who does it? It's in, roughly in, in, in balance. Uh, it's small. It is not only big multinational corporations. It, it used to be essentially uh, big and medium-sized companies. Now we're trying to encourage thousands of small firms, of small entrepreneurs on both sides of the border to link with, with one another, and we're quite successful. So it is, uh, you know, it is small, medium-sized, big multinationals trading in everything. Would you please uh, describe what's happening with the Canadian uh, military and what its, its future is? Our military uh, has, uh, has gone through a difficult uh, phase uh, in, in recent uh, months. Uh, a number of factors, first of all, uh, they have been subjected to uh, tough budgetary uh, constraints also. I mean, our armed forces have, have gone from uh, uh, 90,000, we, we don't have a big army as you have, to, to about uh, 65,000. Uh, there has been, unfortunately, uh, what is described in the, by the media, the, the Somalia incident uh, that, is, that has resulted in, into some kind of open inquiry that seems to go on and on about who, who has done what, who knew what. Uh, uh, unfortunately, some, some events have happened that we're not very proud of. Uh, having said all of that, um, I think that in terms of uh, quality training, our military still is, is pretty good. I mean, when you see that uh, our, military, our military is asked to uh, certainly to perform every time there's a, a difficult peace, uh, peacekeeping operation, uh, the first country that is often asked is, is Canada. So obviously, when it comes to peacekeeping, we, we're still uh, pretty good. The dangers, of course, is that uh, if you reduce by 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 too many, you, you lose your 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 uh, not your nucleus, but your uh, what constitutes a, what we call it in, in French the critical mass, la masse critique, to be able not only to to participate in peacekeeping operations more than one, but also defend defend your 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 borders. So there is some worry in Washington, and this is often brought to my attention that they are watching carefully to make sure that we will keep our share of the, of the partnership, that we will be able to, 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 to put in our, our, our weight into this uh, uh, equation. But I, I, I think I can uh, tell you now that our government is, is determined to, uh, to play uh, this role and uh, keep the forces at the level uh, sufficient to, uh, to, uh, to, to play it. How has uh, NAFTA affected your trading with Mexico, and have you seen an exodus of business to Mexico? So far, uh, NAFTA has been uh, good for our trade with, with Mexico. Uh, you have, it has been good for our trade with you. It has been good for our trade for Mexico also. Our, cre our trade, our exports to, uh, uh, to, to Mexico uh, have uh, increased uh, significantly over the last uh, two and a half years. Remember, NAFTA is a very recent agreement, the 1st of January 1994. Uh, our, uh, their exports to Canada have increased even, even more, uh, more so. So, so far, I can tell you that from our perspective, NAFTA has been good because our, our trade with you has increased dramatically. Our, trees, our trade with Mexico has increased also very uh, significantly. But remember, you just cannot compare the two. Uh, we, I mean, our, our total trade with Mexico is less than our than what we do with you in one week, so it it's, it remains uh, quite uh, not as uh, as uh, significant. But since you mentioned uh, NAFTA, uh, NAFTA has created uh, what I call a slow revolution in, in Washington. When I arrived two years ago, NAFTA had just been signed. Your president, uh, uh, President Clinton, had. Uh, uh, picked it up from the previous administration and, and, and got on with, with it. Uh, but I, I was surprised to see how the Mexican connection was not as sufficiently alive as I, I, I thought it would be. But in the last two years, I've seen many small signs that the American administration is, is indeed paying far more attention to Mexico, 
getting closer to Mexico, not only in pure trade terms, all kinds of new links have been developed. You've got now cultural agreements between our three countries, allowing, let's say, hundreds of young artists to come and live here and, and, and hundreds of young American artists going to Mexico down there and they're provided with, with cheap accommodation and it's created all kinds of, of new cultural links. And I think that this is what you will see in the, in the decades to come, is our, our, certainly our two countries uh, getting closer. Mexico, of course, is, is, has a different, uh, is not in the same league yet. I mean, it's not yet a, a, a first, totally a first world uh, economy. Uh, the devaluation of the base has been a traumatic experience in Washington. Suddenly, the brakes were, were put on. Suddenly, fast track was refused. Suddenly, Chile didn't come in, NAFTA before the end of, uh, of 95. So, the, the Mexican part uh, will have to be closely watched, but Mexico is a great country. I mean, I've lived there, as you, as you probably know, or if you don't know, I'm telling you. I've lived there for, for three and a half years as ambassador of, of our country. It has a, a huge population, 90 million people. It has a, it's many countries in one. It has a, a skilled labor force. It, it has the will to, to bring itself into the first world. So I'm confident that over the years, NAFTA will, will uh, continue to be, a, to be a success. So it's a long answer to a short question, but I, I thought I should say these. Why isn't uh, Canadian television more available in the United States? It is. It is. In many, many parts uh, of the U.S., you can, I'm, I'm sure many will, uh, will confirm this in this room, you can, uh, you can catch uh, uh, our uh, good programs from, from Canada. Again, in the comparison between our two countries, we like to think that we have a great television, great television programming, great news. In fact, countless Americans have told me, especially in the northern states, that they love to watch the CBC. So uh, I don't know if you live in a part of the country where you, you cannot it's catch it. <laughs> it's available only, of course, through a satellite dish. But uh, presumably, the level of interpenetration will increase because this is the way, the, the way of the future, of course. We Canadians know you so intimately. We, I would be happy if you could know us as intimately as we know you. <laughs> the question is, looking at drugs and uh, schooling, um, would you uh, compare an education? Uh, would you compare those things in the United States and Canada, uh, in rural areas, urban areas, everywhere, and anywhere yeah. else you can think of? Good, yeah. <laughs> no, uh, again, uh, I'm glad you're asking this question because it is. Uh, we have different different approaches, different policies when it comes to uh, uh, to uh, gun control legislation, the drug problem, um, drugs. Drugs are a problem in, in my country, uh, as well as, uh, as it is uh, here. Perhaps not to the same uh, level. We don't, have the, uh, we don't have the same seriousness in the problem. In rural areas, the problem is almost uh, non-existent. In big cities, uh, we have uh, the problem. All our big cities uh, certainly suffer from, from this uh, Malédiction, as we uh, as we say in French, we have uh, strong programs to try to rehabilitate uh, drug uh, young people who who are uh, taking drugs and and who uh, express a desire to uh, to stop this uh, this uh, addiction. We're also trying, of course, very hard with you to protect uh, our our borders from the entry of illegal drugs. And we're lucky because we're further north. As you know, the, the great sources of, of drugs for North America are, are coming from uh, down south. And therefore, your country is, is, is more, more exposed because it is, uh, it is closer. Uh, so I w it's very difficult to quantify the, the difference, but it is, uh, it is uh, uh, significant. Uh, it is significant uh, just by uh, checking the, the, the level of violence, uh, crime related to, uh, to drugs. Uh, for me, uh, a Canadian living in Washington for the last two years and a bit more, I'm still um, astonished by the, the extraordinary level 
of violence uh, that does exist. And most Canadians, every Canadian coming down to the U.S. is, is always struck by this. Uh, we have uh, perhaps, uh, I don't know, uh, one twenty-fifth of the violence that you, you, you have in, in, in your country. Main reason, of, of course, is, is gun control. I know it's a very, very emotional issue, and I will not uh, provoke you, but we have very tough gun control legislation in Canada. Very, very tough. We feel that if bicycles are to be registered, guns should be registered. Each and every gun has to be registered. So th this is perhaps, again, a, a difference. Uh, but I I'm not criticizing because the history of our two countries is different. But perhaps it is uh, one of the positive results of having uh, tough uh, gun control legislation. But drugs, uh, to come back to this, uh, w will, uh, will have to be more effectively fought in the years to come. Uh, the administration has appointed a new drug czar. Uh, it's coming now from new sources, uh, not only the, the traditional ones in South America, but one closer to home, to your border. Uh, this is uh, going to remain a very difficult issue for, uh, for our, our two countries, but uh, we will try to uh, keep the problem away for as long as we can. You, uh, you made a comparison, a favorable comparison, of the Canadian medical system to the American, uh, noted the coverage of care and the fact that Canada spends uh, less per capita uh, uh, or, or less uh, of its percentage of GNP than the United States has. The question is, um, why do so many Canadians come to the United States uh, for treatment? A, and B, would you comment about upon uh, comparative life uh, expectancies, if you know that? I'm glad to uh, answer this question because you might not know this, but we live one year longer than you do down here. <laughs> But to, to answer your question yeah, more... Violence wasn't a factor, however. <laughs> so obviously there's something working here. But uh, t y your question is, is, is valid. It's true that for certain types of surgery, uh, surgery that can wait, if you want to uh, have a new uh, hip, for instance, and if you want the, your hip operation uh, the, the following day, you might have to wait for, for a couple of weeks and people, I mean, the doctor will tell you, listen, you have lived with that old hip for 50 years, you can wait three more weeks. For people who want to have it done right away, yes, it's true, they're, they're coming uh, down to the States. But the, the reverse is also true. We have thousands of Americans coming to, to our hospitals, to our doctors in, in Canada to be, to be treated free. You know, it's great to have fast service. It's also great to have free service. If it, if it the, the ambassador is not provoked, but he's stimulated uh, responses. <laughs> Mr. Ambassador, it's been a wonderful evening for us. Uh, we thank you very much. It's been full, comprehensive. The, the title of his address was, was huge. And uh, the material covered, indeed, has been huge and, and in depth, and we appreciate it. If we had the, the comparable order to the Aztec Eagle, we'd give you our order of the Baltimore <laughs> order. Thank you so much. Thank you.